Marvin, tell us a little bit about your upbringing. You're not from these shores. You don't sort of speak the way we speak, but tell us, where are you from? Where were you born, and where did you grow up? Um, I came from um, a small country called Trinidad and Tobago, which is in the Caribbean, which is one of the small islands that makes up the Caribbean, with also Jamaica, Barbados, and these other countries. Um, it's a lovely wee island, obviously. <laughs> sunshine and sea, much more warmer than here. So, um, a lovely country of Trinidad and Tobago. As a young boy growing up, um, I grew up with my grandmother, who always taught me to respect my elders, um, tell people good morning, good evening, and also pray to God first thing in the morning and last thing at night. So, I always I brought up in a Christian home with a family who always prayed, and obviously, I, as a young boy, I went to Catholic Church when I was younger, made my first communion, my confirmation. So I always had that background of um, praying to God and believing in, in God as a, as, at a very young age. But my grandmother was the, the person who really led me to that part to believe that there is a God who loves and cares for me. Amen. Stephen, know a wee bit more about you and uh, your background, but, but tell everyone, uh, where, where did you grow up? You grew up in that wonderful part of God's vineyard. Tell east, us where that is. East Belfast. Amen. Uh, the, uh, as, the, Amen. as the Glen men sing, East, East, East Belfast. East, East, uh, East Belfast. But, uh, yeah, I, I came from the Stormont area. Uh, grew up. Snobby area. The swanky snob, area. The snobby, swanky area. We, we played all our junior football at the grounds of Stormont there when we used to be able to get over the fence or the, the old iron railings and play a little bit of football. Uh, and that's really where I grew up and went to the Stormont Presbyterian Church through Cubs and Scouts. Uh, Enjoyed all of those activities, sent along faithfully Sunday school. We, did, we didn't come from a Christian home. Mom and Dad sent us, though, maybe to get all four of us out of the house. Um, but we grew up in the church, uh, enjoyed all the activities. And, and so there's always been that sort of, uh, all of the, all, that question was always in my mind, you know. Uh, and through Sunday schools and good teachers and Sunday schools, the faithful people who do that work, sometimes... You know, there's probably a lot of folk in tonight from churches who are Sunday school teachers and youth youth workers, and and sometimes you think at a very young age, maybe you know your your work's not being recognised or whatever with with young kids that don't listen to you. Well, I, I believe that those young kids at five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten are listening a lot. So you each had some form of you were sent to Sunday school or you were sent to church. Sure. And that was the case in many many homes. I I was the same. You know, as I, I'm from the. I'm from the poor end of East Belfast, I have to say, like bottom of D Street. And uh, we were sent to Banbury Street Mission Hall, but didn't want to go. But I went because you got Walker's Caramels for a penny. And they give you a, they give you a caramel for going. And I thought that was great. But, there was, but there's been religion. There's a difference in religion and salvation. So Marvin, tell us a little bit. Uh, growing up in, with the influence of your grandmother, there had, to be, there had to be a time, there had to come a point, but or in your life when you realize that growing up in a Christian home or growing up with people who are, have a godly influence, that doesn't, that doesn't make you godly. It doesn't make you a Christian. So can you remember the time that um, for yourself you had to make that decision? Um, well, obviously, you know, just as you said, you know, as a young, a young boy growing up, obviously I'm still under my parents' care and stuff like that. So, you know, they are really responsible for me. But um, my salvation of confessing Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and asking him to come into my heart came when I, when obviously I left Trinidad and Tobago to come on a two weeks trial at, um, in Scotland. Um, obviously, it was miraculously, you know, obviously, my, I worked in a brewery, played football part-time and worked part-time. The general manager of the brewery called me into his office one day and told me that, I want you to go and show the world your talent. Bought me a ticket and tell me I'm sending you to Scotland. I was like, where? So I didn't have the slightest idea where Scotland was. Um, I knew where England was. Um, but they told me he wanted to send me to, on a two-week trial to, to Scotland. Um, I did my research on Scotland. I get back the same answer that it was a very cold country. <laughs> and <laughs> so I was saying to myself, what did I do to this manager that he would send me to a cold country to, on a two-week trial? But um, obviously, I went to Motherwell Football Club, had a two-week trial. Alec McLeish was the manager at that time. He didn't sign me. He told me he was looking for a more experienced defender at that time. So I moved on. My agent arranged for me to go to, 
to um, Rate Rovers Football Club, where Jimmy Nichol was the manager at that time, um, which was in the year of 1997, September 1997. Um, Jimmy Nichol called me in for a two weeks trial. I did really well, and in, come February 1998, I signed my first professional contract for Rate Rovers Football Club. At that time, trying to get used to the Scottish lifestyle, the haggis and the fish and chips and you know, the, the food that they, they have there. Then playing with Red Rovers, I suffer an injury called ulcerosis pubis, where I have inflammation in your pelvis. I've been to doctors, I've been to specialists. They told me that, Marv, if you don't take a surgery and put a metal plate in your stomach, you will not be able to continue to play professional football. I told them I was not going to do that. I had a fellow countryman called Tony Roger, who lived in Concordia at that time, played football with Red Rovers as well. He was playing with Hibernian Football Club at that time. Told me that, Marv, you know, I'm going to take you to my church this, you know, this um, one Sunday evening. Because in my teenage years, I always prayed to God first thing in the morning, last thing at night. But I stopped going to church after a period of time because I saw some activities took place in church that, you know, discouraged me from going to church. So Tony Roger took me to church that day. I told the minister my problem, my situation. And it's the first time I heard somebody said to me that Jesus Christ can heal you from that problem. I always hear people talk about the story about Jesus Christ raising the dead, healing the sick, but I never thought that Jesus Christ can actually physically do that for you in your body at this present time. So my minister showed me in the scripture what Jesus Christ can do, where the Bible says, when you are sick, say you are well. Um, obviously, I used to go to, after trading to the um, church every, every day, prayed with my minister, and then one day I was training, and I felt the pain in my stomach left me. Never suffer from ulcerosis pubis ever again, while doctors told me I may never play again or never return to football unless I take a surgery and put a metal plate in my stomach. After that, I said that if God can do this for me, what else God cannot do for me? And it was in the year of 1999 that I fully gave my life to Jesus Christ, became born again in the water and the Holy Spirit, and that was the transformation for me. Amen. <laughs> you know, when I hear of people, sometimes we're, we're a bit skeptical of them, we're a bit afraid to pray for healing and things, and, and I want to ask you about another thing later on about, your, your, about a healing that you've experienced as well. But I often say when I'm praying for people who are sick, you know, I, I pray along these lines, I say, Father, I believe what your Word says. I don't know whether today you will choose to move in sovereign power and heal, but I believe that you can, and so therefore I pray that you will, Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. And a prayer like that is a prayer of faith, and it's a very real prayer, and you're a testimony to the fact that God's still healing today. Amen. Stuart introduces to the Scripture from Isaiah 53, and by His stripes we are healed, and, and we understand that to mean salvation in all its forms. Stephen, tell us a little bit about, um, you went to Glen Torren as a young man. Maybe you're not, a, you're not, you're not walking with God, as, as the saying goes, but Glen Torren had a profound effect on your life, or, or the people at Glen Torren, should I say? Yeah, sure. Um, as a young boy, you're, you're trying to make your way in the game. Um, came through Orangefield School, uh, went to Glen Torren as, you know, I, I, from East Belfast, and I met a guy called Terry Moore when I was there. Terry was a Canadian World Cup International came back from uh, his travels with Victor Moreland uh, and the two of them signed for, for Glen Torn. And whenever you're only a young boy, I was 16 in, a, in the environment, you're trying to make your way. A lot of the first team players don't really pick up with the kids, you know. And, uh, but Terry had this something about him, let's say, and uh, I remember both of us were injured. Uh, we were in the, the, the treatment room and, and, and Terry started to chat with me and, and he, he basically just said, you know, he said, I've done this and done that in my life. And he said, I could have went a very different road. He said, I got caught up with a lot of bad guys. He said, but he says, when I went to America, uh, he says, and then I progressed in, in Canada with the football, he says, I found God. And, and, and he, he shared his testimony pretty much with me. And, and although at 16, I really didn't do anything about it there and then, but there was that seed that had been sown into my life right there that, that has, has sat with me from a, you know, a, a long time. And uh, 
as you, as you move on in your life, I I met a, a lovely young girl. Uh, I see her here tonight. She, uh, you know, it's like you fall in love with these people, and then they, all of a sudden you're down the aisle with them, and they're taking all your money. Uh, <laughs> but she knows I love her. Uh, but anyway, she, we, we started dating, we started going together, and, and it turned out Lydia's mum and dad were uh, born-again Christians from a, a local uh, church hall in East Belfast as well, Branham Mission Hall. And I remember them encouraging us and saying, well, you, well, you know, would you come to church? You know, would you like to come? And they kept inviting us to a, a meeting. And of course, we were going to a meeting, you know, no chance we're doing that, you know. So we were, uh, we were just going together, but we, they kept persistently asking us, and we said, look, Let's do this. Let's let's go, and, uh, and 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 really, in around the age of 19, you were sort of hanging about. You're still, you're trying to find yourself, as they say nowadays, with young people. Uh, and we we went along, and 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 I listened to the preaching and heard a lot about the blood of the lamb, and and I heard all of these statements, and I'm going, what's this all about? You know, don't I understand all this? But as as it sat with me, and uh, some of the stuff that Terry had talked about two or three years earlier some of the stuff that was being talked about now. And then Lydia and I were sort of not entirely sure what was, what, where we were. And we were happened to be walking over the, the hill this day in, in around where Lydia, Lydia lived. And we were heading over to the, the, the sweet shop. Imagine you know, two, two young kids going to get sweets in those days. I don't know what to do nowadays. But anyway, we bumped into a crowd of Christian people who were walking the street, young people from a local church. And they started chatting to Lydia and I, and we were just walking over. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to say to myself, well, we've had this conversation, we've had the Brandon Mission Hall conversation, we've bumped into these guys, and then that was on the Thursday night. On the Sunday, I'm going to, I was playing for Ards at the time, and we were traveling over to the, uh, to the Ards Sportsman Service, the annual Sportsman Service. And I remember going over the, the hill in this Renault 5 Turbo with Timmy Kelly. And the, I think it's restricted... 45 miles an hour restricted. We were doing 105 over the hill in the, in the Newton Arts. And I knew that moment. I said, if I die in this car tonight, I haven't made my peace with God. I haven't committed my life to Him. And I went to that meeting and sat in that meeting. Didn't listen to a word the minister said. I just sat and thought about all the other things over the last two or three years. And in simple childlike faith, I, I didn't even go and talk to Lydia about it. Came home and said, God, I need to give my life completely to you because only you can, can, can take me where I need to go. And simple childlike faith, down in the bedside, just said, God, come into my life. Yeah. Take, take this burden of sin away. Yeah. Not that I was a bad guy, but I knew the difference. Mm. And I came and told Lydia the next night, and Lydia said, I've been thinking exactly the same thing. And she went and talked to her dad, and, and he led her to the Lord the, the very yeah. next night. So, God doesn't make it. There's no mistakes in God. No. And, and that's the thing that I have, you know, that was the 1st of December, 1985. I made that decision, you know, so that was uh, 10 years ago. Uh, yeah. Nearly 30 years ago. And God impacts your life. A dramatic change. You know, people, you know, you, you come to events like this and, you, and you, you talk about your faith and what you've done and all of that there. All I can really say sometimes is God comes in and hits you with a sledgehammer. It's not, it's not a it's not just this willy-nilly thing. It's a sledgehammer experience when he says, I'm going to impact your life, and I'm going to, set, I'm going to pour petrol all over you and set you on fire. Mm -hmm. And that was my experience. Amen. That God just said, I'm going to take you somewhere. And, you, and just to finish this, because I'm, I'm starting to talk now and I shouldn't. But to go back to Terry Moore, and I was playing now for Arge. I'd left Glen Torn because they, they threw me out. And I came back to play against Terry. And as the players go and check their studs on the pitch, I went over and uh, he was in one camp, I was in the other. And I went over to speak to him. I said, Terry, I have news for you. You had a conversation with me three years ago. I want to tell you, last week, I gave my life to Jesus. Amen. And he said to me, he hugged me and he says, Stephen, he says, you've made the biggest decision of your life. He says, and here's my one word of advice. Be prepared to walk through the doors that God is going to open for you. And I could keep you here all night with those uh, stories, for but... Sure. God opened those doors. Amen. And we have Amen. been blessed. You know that. Yep. We yep. have been blessed in everywhere yep. we've went yep. with this message that God has put into our hearts yep. because we carry, we carry the, the lamp yeah. and we say, Jesus is our, our life. Yep. Jesus is our guide. 
Jesus is our hope. Yeah. Jesus is everything. Amen. And that's what my experience of all of this. Amen. And, that's, and that's, that's, that's what it's all about. So as a young man at, at 19, can I just say to the parents out there as well, Stephen's father-in-law and mother-in-law were given the right advice. You, he, I could tell you a story about my daughter. Don't let any Tom, Dick, or Harry near your daughter. You seek a good Christian man. And it's important, and it's good advice. You know, it's really good advice. And can I encourage you as well, if you're here and if you're praying for people like Terry Moore did for Stephen, he gave him the best advice. And don't give up. Keep, keep at it. Keep at people because they're, they're, they're worth it. That, that's a lovely story. Marvin, give us a career highlight. Give us a, 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 a career highlight. What, can I venture one? What's it like to beat Celtic? <laughs> What's it? Sorry, I was going to say, what's it like to stuff Celtic, but I don't want to offend anybody. You know, what's it like to beat Celtic in a big game? Um, obviously, you know, it's the rivalry of you know Scottish football. Obviously, you know Northern Ireland, you know Rangers, Celtic. But um, it's always good to to beat your rivalry, and obviously, it's, I don't think there's a better feeling that you can get to know to beat your 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 rival in in an old firm game. And as I said, I'm not support of the other side of it, the bigotry and the, the religious side, but I think it's one of the, the best games you can play in as a, either you're playing for Rangers or Celtic, but it's a, a fantastic game to be part of. Fantastic game. A lot of uh, focus on you as a, a player, build up to those games must be, must be quite intense. I mean, I think of, you've been in cup finals, you've been in many big games here locally, um, big two games. Would be would be the, the high you know the, the big thing here Linfield Glen Torren biggest crowds if you're down this neck of the woods it's Glenavon Porta Down it's a big game you know but the intensity of a of an old firm game well, how do you deal with that as a Christian but is there how, how do you I mean I know that my way of doing when any team I ever was with before we went out I got onto my knees in the dressing room mm -hmm. Stephen would have always I went down on my knees just praying and mm -hmm. some players would walk around you and. You used to have hair at the time. They'd rub your hair and rub your head and things. And <laughs> as if it was like they were getting a bit of luck off you. But, but I used to give the game to God. You know, you used to say, mm -hmm. Lord, this is your game. Mm -hmm. This is for you. This is for your glory. Mm -hmm. do, do you have experiences like that? Where yeah, well, I, for me, I, you know, I pray first thing in the morning, you know, commit the game into God's hand, let God's will be done. Pray for protection from injuries, accidents, for myself, even our opponents as well. So I used to commit the go game in God's hand and go with a confidence because the Bible says that God said I will be with you wherever you go. The Bible also says that I've given you the ability and the power to succeed and to get wealth. So I believe that, you know, every one of us here has a talent. The greatest problem is when you don't use your talent. And I know that God has given me a talent to play football and I used to go there and express that talent at the best of my ability, because I know this is the talent that God has given to me, and that's how I repaid God back. There's a lovely scripture in 1 Peter 4, 11. It says, if any man minister, let him minister with the ability that God alone provides, amen. so that in all things, God may be glorified. Yes, amen. You know, we do it for him. Amen. No matter what it is, we, we, we do it for his glory. Mm. Stephen, you must have a lot of career highs in the Irish League. I know you're a very successful manager now. You've, you've made the transition from player, player, manager. I can speak with experience about that. It's not easy, not an easy thing to do. Sure. But um, you've led Crusaders to the All-Ireland Satanta Cup, but have you, uh, any highlights from our God Squad years? I mean, this was a great anomaly in football, or the great dichotomy, I should say. They called us on one hand, the God Squad, and on the other hand, Marvin, they called us the Hatchet Men, <laughs> because we used to kick lumps out of people and love them. And that was true. Have you, have you, have you highlighted from any, any story you want to share? You know, again, the, the stories are just uh, unending. Um, obviously, lots of highlights in football. You know, obviously, winning Satanta was good as a, uh, in, in a managerial capacity. Um, but the year that we, we came together as a group, uh, our first league championship year, I, I sort of, what's your memories? It's the year. It's not maybe just the one game. But uh, for me, it was... You know, we picked up from the, the story of uh, where we were at Glen Torren and, and then I went to Linfield and, and then when I came to your house and we signed uh, with us, you know, I, I really believe that, that God moment of if you come and sign, we'll win the league. And I actually said, I dead on, Roy, in my head. 
you know, we hadn't won it in 19 years. You were convinced, and I'm coming. But it wasn't, well, it's the football was the football, and we went and did that. The events of the God Squad that came together and how that came together, because I was just, you know, up against Glendon Lop, who was an absolute animal as a footballer, as you, as you know. And, uh, and I'd heard, I'd, there was Terry, there was Terry, Moore, there was Johnny Jamison, there was myself. We were the three sort of Christian guys playing. And for a number of years, before Sturdy and all the guys all came in after that. But when I got the call from yourself and, and said, I want you to come over, I was sort of going, Glenn Dunlop had just become a Christian. And I'm sort of saying, I'll go over and encourage Glenn. You know? And I land two, three months into Glenn becoming a Christian. And Glenn Dunlop was... I'd, I'd got there, and all of a sudden, he had already spoke to Sydney Burroughs and, and uh, the Sturdy and, and Glenny Hunter. So all of a sudden, there's five Christian footballers in the one team. And then all of a sudden, we've got Roy uh, recommitting his life to God after a while. Roy McDonald. Uh, all of a sudden, the head count goes to a dozen. We had, we had our old Jock Gilmore. Jock Gilmore was our club physio. Uh, physio. He was 79, and he says, it's about time I became a Christian. So he joined us, and there was 12 of us, and we took over the boardroom, and we prayed in the boardroom through the year with five Dublin players who came up to play with us every week. Uh, and, and these lads were from a Roman Catholic background who didn't know an awful lot about, uh, about the Christian uh, ethos. But all of a sudden, they were among us, and we were praying with them, and we were helping them. And the football was nearly like a sidetrack because God was moving like a wind through a football club. And I had never seen anything like it in Irish League football. I've been a Christian a while, coming with uh, Terry and Johnny were at Glen Torn. I was on my own. Uh, and then all of a sudden, God moved through a football club. And we got labeled the God Squad. And we, took the, and we went on to win the Gibson Cup that year by 15 clear points. We won it by a country mile. And we were able to take that trophy all around Northern Ireland, every church and youth club, and, and, and preach the gospel on the back of it because God decided to move. And people remember saying to me very, very early in my career, you shouldn't be involved in football. And I say, you know something? Don't hide your light under a bushel. God wants to move wherever He can move. Yeah. And whenever people hear the message of hope and salvation, let it come wherever it comes. Amen. Amen. Marvin, tell us about the time that you were told you couldn't play. You've given us one experience, and then we're, we'll, 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 we'll bring things to a close soon. But tell us about what happened when the doctors told you there's a big cup final coming up, and you've got a really bad, was it a cruciate ligament injury? It's a ligament, though. Which for many players is terminal. Uh, you're cruciate on your knee. It's a, it's a, it's a terminal injury for footballers. Mm -hmm. Certainly you don't recover from it in a matter of weeks or months. Tell us what happened. Um... Playing for Rangers against Dundee, um, obviously we chasing Celtic. We had a cup final, the CIS Cup final the other week. One of the went and tackled the striker, fell on my knee, and bent my knee back the way. So when my knee bent back the way, it went past the level where it's supposed to, and my crucial ligament overstretched. Now your cru your crucial ligament is the ACL. Is call it your ACL. Is the muscle that holds your knee together. It's like the foundation of your knee. That if that is not in place, you may be walking and your knee can just collapse without your ACL. Any footballer right now, any sportsman that suffer ACL, he will be out for at least nine months to a year. Some players never recover from it. I suffered this injury, went to Rangers, went to all the, the specialists. I went to three specialists down England. All of them came back with a diagnosis that, Marv, you have to take an operation if you want to continue to play. I said, okay, no problem. I went in a, into my prayer closet, consult God. I said, God, do you want me to take this surgery or you do you want me to, to believe you? God said, I prayed for about at least a week constantly. God said, no, I want you to believe me. Went back to Rangers, meet with the, the technical staff, meet with all the, the physios and the doctors, I say that, no, I'm not going to take a surgery. God is going to heal me. They say, what? Marv, are you crazy? Is your career you are dealing with here and all this different stuff? So I had a big meeting with them. David Murray, all the technical staff, they were like sitting there. 
I alone sitting here with God at my side. And they said to me, Marv, we respect your faith, we respect your belief, but here is a disclaimer. Sign it, <laughs> take full responsibility <laughs> for, for your, your decision so that if you collapse in any game or in training, Rangers Football Club will not take the responsibility because we are offering you the best medical advice and service, but you are rejecting it. I signed it, no problem. Then that it was, what, three, four weeks? Because I was roughly out for six weeks with my ACL, which has probably never been done before. Then um, Alec McLeish called me. He said, Marv, yes, I respect your faith. I respect your belief, but... I want to see the same Marvin Andrews out on the pitch, playing the same way, tackling the same way, winning headers the same way as before you get your ACL. I say, okay, no problem. I will show you that God has healed me. So they took me out on a trial run. I did all type of tests that you can ever think about. Jump on one leg. They had people banging into me, tackling me to see if my knee will hold up. By the grace of God, I passed all the tests. Then, coming up, five games to go before the season finished in 2005. The game we had to play, and I'm just coming back from injury, six weeks out with my ACL. It's never been done. It's all over the back of the, the, back of the papers. Marvin said that God will heal him all over the news. They even phoned my mother in Trinidad and Tobago <laughs> and tell her, please beg your son to go and take a surgery. My mom called me crying. Son, listen to them. And... No, I, I say, Mom, God has already told me not to take my surgery. Don't worry, everything will be okay. They, they call ex-Christians, ex-footballers who, who, in, who um, the injury has finished the career. People in, who, went, who, can, who never played again because of the injury, because of how serious it was. They had loads of ex-Christians calling and people on the papers saying that I'm crazy, I'm mad. God still worked through doctors, so trust the doctors. There was a big, there was a, um, a Scottish centre half called Lee Wilkie. He was one of the players told me that, Marv, don't trust no God, trust the doctors. He suffered the same injury just like me. He, his career is finished, and he's, he's about 10 years younger than me. Now, I continue to trust God, keep praying every day, going into training, keep praying. Then, as I said, McLeish, there was a dilemma for Ms. Um, Alec McLeish because we were playing Celtic in the next game. So he's in a dilemma to play Marvin or not to play me because my knee might collapse as the doctors told him and the specialists told him. But for some reason, God touched his heart and I was in the starting 11. It is in the first time in playing football, I've seen a camera on me for 83 minutes that I play. If I dig my nose, it was showing up on the camera. If I spit on the floor, it was showing up on the camera. Because nobody could have ever believed that a guy can do his ACL and come back playing after six weeks. Craig Bellamy, one of the guys, he said, I need to see this with my eyes to see if this guy will play in this old firm game. As we all know, old firm games are one of the biggest games in world football. I went on to play. I played 83 minutes. We lose the game 2 0 against um, Celtic that day. Obviously, I played 83 minutes. I couldn't play the full 90 because I was knackered. I haven't played for six weeks. And, you know, they couldn't believe it that I actually played. But I continued playing on for the remaining of that season. Miraculously, by God's grace, we won the league at the last day, Helicopter Sunday, as most Rangers fans may know. Won the, won, won the league on the, dramatically on the last day of the season. And I also went on to continue playing for my country, flying all over the world, and lead my country to their first ever World Cup in 2006. I continued playing with my knee for four years after doctors told me that I will not make one step on that field again if I don't take an ACL. How did I do it? Put in absolute faith and trust in God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was what happened. As I said, you can further get on my DVD of exactly what happened because there's so much little stuff, but I can't take up all the time. But it's to let you know 
with God, all things are possible. Not some, all. So it doesn't matter what you may be facing in your life, what you may be going through, Jesus Christ has the answer to your problems. Amen. Amen. I often say to people that going to God without faith is like going to the shop without money. <laughs> you can look, but you can't appropriate. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. But sometimes we need to exercise that faith and put it into action. Stephen, wrap it up for us. If you were saying to someone, like we've seen the boys, the question is, if you were leaving people with a thought, Maybe people are contemplating, I'd like to know this God. I'd like to know the God who healed Marvin. I'd like to know the God who entered into your life as a 19-year-old. I'd like to know this God. What, what would you say to them to encourage them to do so? I think, I think inside of everybody, Roy, I think it's Romans 1 talks about it, you know, that even the, the, the heavens will cry out, and, and we see it in, the, in nature, and we see it. I think everybody knows inside of them that there's a greater power than us, but you have to surrender to it. You have to, you have to draw alongside and say, this is not about me. This man's played for Rangers on the big world stage. You managed creators, lowly the creators, to two great championships and, and was a, an inspiration to me and, and many others in the game. And, and I've done a few things in the game which I'm proud of, but it means nothing in the overall scheme of things because God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing, and he's the one that we need to commit to. He's the one that is going to guide us through this, this life. And ultimately will one day take us to heaven. And as I was coming here, there was a little, coming up that road today, you know, Lydia was, was talking as she does for Ireland. And, and this little tune kept coming to me. My, one of the, Michael Card, who I, I grew, grew up with, with the songs. And it was, to hear with my heart, to see with my soul, to be guided by a hand I cannot hold, to trust in a way that I cannot see. That's what faith must be. And that little song was there and has been there here the whole night. And I think that's the song. You've got to, you've got to hear it with your heart. You can hear what, what Sturdy has to say and hear what we have to say. But it's inside of your, your heart has to hear it. And you've got to see it with your soul. And be guided by that hand that you can't physically hold, but you know that he, that you're you're in his hand when he when he lays hold of you, you can't get away from it, and that's what I would say. That's what faith must be, and that's the faith that we trusted in and we that we understood and we that we that we fell in love with, and I would say to everybody here tonight, fall in love with the the King of Kings, because he is the answer. And he is the only way. And we, we know him and we experience him every day of our lives. Amen. Guys, would you thank the lads for their contribution? <laughs>